afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm from Worcestershire Archive and Archaeology Service, um, along with my colleague Adam and several other faces in the uh, audience. Um, as we were all aware that community archaeology is a massive part of our sector, and it's really, really popular. Um, the landscape of it has changed over the last 10 to 15 years with the advent of heritage lottery funding. Its popularity is increasing all the time. When we have programs like Digging for Britain, and we've got sites like Must Farm making really innovative use of social media, all helps to keep community archaeology and archaeology itself in the public eye. Um, while we're aware it's really popular, and we, we are more than well aware of the social benefits that comes from taking part in community archaeology, one thing that we haven't considered as a sector is the vast array of research that is coming out um, of this involvement in community archaeology from voluntary groups, community groups, and individual researchers as well. Um, we've never really been able to get a handle on it in the same way as we have done with um, commercial research. And would it really be valuable anyway? You know, what's the point? So, Historic England um, became quite interested in how, um, how much community-generated research was out there and what would its potential value be to um, enhancing existing knowledge bases like historic environment records and research frameworks. Now, I'm going to assume that you all know what those two things are, but if you don't, please shout. Um, so in 2015, so last year, they commissioned us um, to carry out a project to, to look at this and try to establish the, the value of it. I should probably say that it was never our intention and it was never the project's intention to assess the quality of that research. It was purely about the potential value it has um, in enhancing our existing knowledge and evidence bases. So we carried out a survey throughout England um, which basically, uh, so we carried out a survey and we also focused on some more detailed case study areas such as Worcestershire, obviously, um, West Yorkshire and also Norfolk. So all areas that are very well known for their community involvement. We tried to car capture a diverse range of community groups and voluntary groups as we could. So we went to archaeology groups, uh, building recording groups, maritime and diving groups, and all, in, all others that kind of don't fall into any categories. And through a partnership with the British Association for Local History, we got to local history groups as well. The first time it, this, they've ever really been included in a survey like this. So as you can see, we've kind of got quite a broad range of responses. Um, we got over 600 responses to the survey, which was we thought would give us a really good evidence base, and we were really, really pleased with that response. Um, it gave us some surprising and not so surprising results. Um, Mike's slide, one of Mike's slide earlier on, showed that in 2010 the CBA recorded about 2,000 active groups in the UK. Uh, our survey, we had to extrapolate a little bit. Um, but we worked out in the five-year period between 2010 and 2015, about 12,000 projects were um, undertaken, resulting in about 20,000 pieces of work. And that's a conservative estimate. It's likely to be a lot bigger than that, but it re that represents a huge amount of work that's being carried out. So I thought I'd show you some of the key headlines. Um, so first of all, the, the whole point of the project was looking at the potential value. We looked at some of the research in more detail in the different case study areas, and we discovered that the overwhelming answer to that question is yes, it has huge potential value um, for us as a sector in enhancing our evidence bases. We also found that it's been disseminated in a number of different ways. So as you can imagine, through the traditional talks, um, little articles, leaflets, booklets, etc. But over 56% were generating online content, and that's from websites, blogs, etc. But we found of all of that research, only 40% was getting back into historic environment records, so getting back into the evidence base that underpins the planning system. And although it's higher amongst those groups with an archaeological focus, 
only 23% was getting in of information was getting in from local history groups. Now that's not really surprising because we've traditionally engaged more with archaeology groups than we have at local history. There's been very little engagement with community groups when new research frameworks have been commissioned. So it's no surprise that only 45% of respondents had actually even heard of them, let alone used them. But of those that had, three quarters of them had consulted them. And when we asked whether they felt their work could contribute to a wider understanding in their area of interest, 94% of respondents said yes. So they clearly feel they have something to give. We also asked about professional support and advice, and just under half had consulted with their local authority archaeology services, and a large number had also received support from professional freelance archaeologists. And of those carrying out intrusive field work, just over half had received advice from freelance professionals. Leading on from that is quite an alarming statistic um, because only 23% of groups undertaking intrusive field work were depositing their archives with museums. And there's probably going to be several factors at play there, right from the closure of museums to deposition of archives through to having no idea about depositing or how to deposit or what to deposit even. When we asked about funding, the majority are self-funding through membership subscriptions, etc. Um, but 43% receive funding from external bodies, um, such as uh, the HLF. And we found that if they were externally funded, they were more likely co to consult with their local archaeology service or historic environment record, and therefore were more likely to send it back. But even still, we were still losing about half of that information. So only. 51% of groups actually sent their results back in any way. We also tried to uh, find out why they were carrying out research. Um, so just put a little graphic up here. Um, and it resulted in perhaps for me the most surprising result and what I want to focus on today. A significant minority, so just over 16%, we're carrying out research in response to planning and development issues. And that could be uh, responding to planning applications themselves, carrying out conservation area appraisals, or neighbourhood plans. So we delved a little deeper into that because we thought, hmm, that's actually quite interesting, um, to find out why they felt they had to carry out this research in response to planning issues. And in many cases, people were responding because they perceived shortcomings in heritage bodies, and local authority archaeology services or local authorities themselves, and also responding to a reduction in staffing within their local authority archaeology service. I've just got some quotes. Um, so you can hear this is a local group in London. Uh, all this is a normal element of the submissions we make on planning applications, which will impact on heritage assets. Our greatest difficulty is in mustering sufficient interest on the part of four local authorities with which we deal to ensure adequate archaeological conditions and any consent. So they, you know, obviously people feel they need to do this. Uh, some other responses hinted at a, a bit of a deeper attention, um, saying that they were filling in the gaps left by the move that professional units were taking towards developer-led archaeology, um, while we as professionals regard the advent of PPG 16 as largely beneficial. Um, it's clear from some of the responses that groups are a bit more ambivalent about it. Um, we can't say why that might be, but it might be because they resent the fact that professional units no longer have the capacity excuse me, um, to look at sites which are not under development pressure, and that there's more of a, a shift of professional archaeologists towards um, what's under threat rather than what's of interest got a quote here from East Anglia, we aim to look at areas of archaeological potential which cannot be covered by our local archaeological unit since the inception of developer funded archaeology came into being, into being. Thank you Mrs Thatcher. So clearly a little bit of, of tension going on there. So if there's quite a lot of research being generated in response to planning issues, is it being effectively used? 
when we looked at where it, this research was being distributed, we found that the majority of it is just being um, disseminated through their group or to local record or archive offices. Um, we found that only 52% was going back into the historic environment record. So it, a lot of research has been lost. How can you use that research to um, help provide a robust evidence base in, when you're responding to planning applications if you don't have all of the information that you need? Um, while 52% is quite high, there is obviously another half that have no understanding of how archaeology works within the planning system in terms of the use of HERs. And many of them aren't in, in receipt of any advice or support from those local authority services, including HERs. So why is there this disconnect between those community and voluntary groups that are really passionate about championing their heritage and the organisations that underpin archaeology and the planning service in the, the planning system. Well, number one, there's a common uh, perception amongst groups that because they're responding to planning issues, they, re they do not classify that work as research. Um, or they believe for it to be termed research, it must be published in academic journals. So there's two here, the vast bulk of short-term pieces of work. Um, our primary aims are to protect local heritage and educate the local population, very few of whom read academic journals. So, and HER seem to be between a rock and a hard place because some groups see them as purely research focused and some of them see them as purely planning focused with no remit for research. So we're a little bit stuck in the middle. Um, <clears throat> Cuts to local authority archaeology services are putting increasing pressure on community and voluntary groups to plug that gap. But as professionals, we're not doing ourselves any favours here. Um, there's a confusion around roles and responsibilities in archaeology, and that's not just from a voluntary and community group perspective, that's within professional sphere as well, and I'm speaking from personal experience. Um, hand in hand with this, as Lorna says, there's a misunderstanding of how planning and legislation actually works and how much archaeology is protected in which, in reality, they think is protected far more than it is in reality. And then combined with this, you get the bewildering world of native planning. Uh, the Localism Act uh, has allowed parishes the opportunity to influence development in their local area. Um, but the documents, the rules, the methods around such plans are complicated and they're littered with jargon. Groups are paying huge amounts of money to consultants and only to find that their plans are being rejected at inspection, particularly in regard to the historic environment. So how do we tackle this? Um, in Worcestershire, as um, Adam was saying, we are responding this to this by providing workshops, etc. But another way we're doing it is through a project funded, again funded by Historic England, called the Synthesis of Rural Buildings and Their Setting. Uh, Worcestershire is predominantly rural, <coughs> hence why we're looking at rural buildings. It's a multi-layer project, but one of its primary aims was to develop a toolkit and guidance to support the assessment of rural buildings and their settings in the context of community-led planning. Um, in order to do this, we ran a series of workshops with local parish groups and using their feedback along with that of non-heritage professionals, we developed a toolkit called Your Place Matters. We found that while professional engagement is really successful, it's difficult to keep up in the light of capacity issues in local authority services, archaeology services. The toolkit's designed therefore to be hands-off. It provides a really straightforward and simple framework which helps to guide people through the large amount of information available um, so they can identify the historic character and distinctiveness of their area. And in that way, they, consider how, they can consider how the historic character of a place, and specifically their place, can inform issues and opportunities for new development and future growth. Feedback's been positive, and we're hoping that it can be used as a model 
um, for other parts of the country. So here we've got Scott Couple. We're surprised how quickly we came to an overall understanding about what the settlement was about. We could see a focus, patterns, and relationships. And we've got a really nice one here. It does help with the neighbor plan and explains things clearly, which helps to demystify the technical aspects and reduce the stress. That's what we were finding. Oh, just, I'm just wrapping up now. Um, so that's just one example of how we can respond to the increasing involvement of community and voluntary groups um, in planning. But our project identified a range of issues, not all of which were to do with um, archaeology and planning. We've made a number of recommendations. If you want to have a look at our project, it can be found at the Historic England webpage, or you can um, email myself or my colleague Rob Hedge. Um, so the recommendations aim to tackle the issues, but it's going to be a long journey. We can do simple solutions like providing clear guidance about roles and responsibilities, but changing ill-conceived perceptions and long-held views are somewhat more of a challenge. Archaeology and heritage doesn't belong to professionals. Whether you're a local authority or commercial or academic, it belongs to all of us. We need more transparency in archaeology. We need more openness when we're engaging with community groups. There are our strongest advocates, yet we seem to be happy to believe their interest is shallow. We perceive that having a good time ticks the box of adequate engagement. It's about time we found a new approach. <laughs>